Now, before we start the lecture, I mean, uh, you have picked up your quiz. There was a similar question also in the midterm. A significant number of students, when they were asked to draw the the, uh, the electric field lines of a dipole, I mean, okay, you write these ones, but then you also have these ones. Okay, you see, there's no reason for the electric field lines on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, to bend in this direction. You see, originally, if you just take one charge, it will be just like this. This is a positive charge, let's say. If you put a negative charge, some of these field lines will just bend towards the other one. So they will just bend around. So these will also bend a bit, etc. But none of them will bend away from the negative charge. They will all bend towards the negative charge. Yeah, th this is just a common mistake to just bend them somehow. Okay, any questions about this derivation, how to calculate the force acting on a wire? Hmm? Now, we said that, okay, there is this new force, and we will be describing this new force by what we call the magnetic field. Well, what is the magnetic field? We don't know yet. We are just describing the, what we observe. What we observed was, if. It, I mean, we had these rocks that had some kind of a force. We also have seen that if we bring a current close to one of these magnets, the magnet feels a force. But Newton's third law tells me that if the magnet is feeling a force due to the current nearby, the current should also feel a force due to this magnet because of the action-reaction pairs. So now we are studying this force that the current feels. Well, this is a quiz, not the homework, by the way. Now, we are just studying that force. Now, next week, what we will be asking is, what creates this magnetic field? But this week, we are just describing the magnetic field and the force due to this magnetic field. Next week, we will study some a bit why certain materials are magnetic, like these magnets, why they are attracted by magnets, and why certain materials are just don't feel at all this magnetic force. We will say it. Eventually it will turn, I mean, eventually it will also turn out to be, they are the same thing, electric field and magnetic field. They just, they are like the two different faces of the same thing. They are the same phenomena. And that we will also say. Now, let's look at this, this force expression a bit in more detail. We said that if we have some arbitrary current carrying wire in a magnetic field, if we just take a very small segment, which will feel some force in some direction, and that force is given by I times dL cross B. dL, a vector in the direction of I. This is what we know. Now, we also had discussed what I is. I, the current, is mainly the total charges, let's say there are n charges that each having a charge, n point charges like n electrons, each having a charge Q that passes through the segment in a time, let's say dt. In the time dt, all of the charges in the segment just pass through this point, let's say point A. And Q charges, charges, pass point A in a time dt. So this is how we define the current. It is the charge passing through a point 
per unit time. Now, if we put it over here, df is equal to i, which is this expression, and q dl by dt cross b. Now, let's just imagine we have all these charges. Let's just, it will be simplifying greatly. We have these charges along this very small segment. They are all moving with the same velocity. Now, all of these charges pass through this point in a time dt. So let's just take this one. This one will be the last one that passes through this point. This one will pass through this point that it will travel this distance dl in a time dt. So dl over dt is nothing but the velocity of these charges. This is equal to the number of charges times q v cross b. And from here, we can deduce that the force per unit charge, force that each point charge feels is will be given by this expression. This is the force that each charge feels. due to the magnetic field. So this is what each one of those charges will feel. Do we see any problem in this expression? Okay, so if you take a point charge, if you take a point charge, if there is, it's in a region where there is an electric field and a magnetic field, of course it will feel a force due to the electric field. Now we also see that it will feel a force due to the magnetic field. So this will be the total force, total electromagnetic force that the point charge will feel. Okay, still, do you see any problem over here? No, no, not that one. Remi remember what the Galilean relativity tells us. Uh, if you combine this one with relativity principle, Galilean relativity, the one that we studied, you see that there is a problem over here. Uh, we will be addressing it later on, not now. Uh, so let's just imagine this one. We are in a region of space where there is only a magnetic field. There is no electric field, so this is the only force that it feels. It will be accelerating, right? So, so because it, it's feeling a force. Well, the charges, they will have a mass, so it, it will have an acceleration. We don't know the mass, but it, will, it has a mass. All the charges we know, they have masses. So it will be accelerated. Acceleration is independent of which reference, which inertial reference frame you are in. Every inertial reference, if, if a charge is accelerating, it has an acceleration A. In every inertial reference frame, it has the same acceleration A. Now let's imagine we go to a reference frame in which this particle, this charge doesn't have any velocity, it is at rest. So let's say that at a given instant, we started to move with the charge at the same, at the same velocity that the charge has at that instant. At that instant, the charge will not have any velocity. If it doesn't have any velocity at that reference frame, it may, we are still in an inertial reference frame, it that in that inertial reference frame, V will be zero, so it will not feel any force and it will not feel any acceleration, if this is true. If this, is, if this was the whole story. No, it will not feel a force, because it will be at rest. In one inertial frame, it is accelerating. In another inertial frame, it's not accelerating. Well, this shouldn't be the case.
Well, this is a question that you should keep in mind. What happens with collision relativity? Because I mean, all the physics that we are developing, they are just going based on what we previously know. So we already know Newton's mechanics is before, at, after Newton's mechanics, we know Galilean relativity, we know all these inertial reference frames, all the concepts that we are using or defining are based on those, the same basic principles. They are the basis of our definitions. And now we, are, we come to a conclusion in which the Galilean relativity, at least, doesn't seem to be satisfied. What we will be observing will depend on which reference frame we choose. So that shouldn't be. I mean, we should somehow resolve it eventually. We will do it, but just keep it in mind. There, there are still some questions that you should be asking. OK. You see, is it an inertial reference frame? That's the question. If you just move with a mass, of course, the acceleration will be always zero. Even if it feels a force, it will be zero. But is it an inertial reference frame? If it's not an inertial reference frame, f is equal to ma doesn't hold anyway. OK, this is just keep in mind. Now, let's calculate the direction of this force. Now, before, let, let's do a few examples. First, let's go back to our example of a uh, wire in a magnetic field. Now, we had already discussed that if there is a current running through the wire, it will feel a force. So we might make use of that force. If you want to make some device like a motor, we can make use of that force. Let's just imagine that we have a region of space where, we ha where there is a uniform magnetic field And in this region, we put a loop. And this is connected to a wire, to a battery. OK, let's just imagine it like this. We have, I have this magnetic field vertically up a uniform magnetic field. The circumference of this keyboard is our wire. So it is placed like this, at an angle. That figure is supposed to be that one. So there is a current running in this direction. Or if you just look at it from, OK, so this, if you look at it from, the, let's say, this is my wire. The current is going in from the top, going out from the bottom. There's a uniform magnetic field in one direction. And this is my loop. The current is going in from here, out from here. So I have this uniform magnetic field. This is my wire the circumference. So, no, I mean, this is the magnetic field. It is for, it's not like this. It's not vertical. It makes an angle. Let's just say that this, that angle is 90 degrees, theta degrees. From one side, it will look like this. From the other side, it will look like this. Yes, the vertical lines is the magnetic field. In this picture, it is going inside the screen. In this one, in these two, it's going from up to down. And the current is running in this direction. Again, but all of them are showing this, this system. In one of them, I'm just looking at it like this from the side. On the other one, I'm looking at it like this. And from the, in the big one, I'm just looking at it from the top.
Maybe I should better erase this one. Okay. These two seems to be clear. So what is the force acting on this one? Let, let, let's look at this picture. Let's take this picture. This is the B. I have four straight segments, each one carrying a current I. What will be the force, let's say the segment one, segment two, three, and four? Okay, what is the force that segment one feels? What is its direction? Towards the center of the wire, towards us. To going up, towards us, towards us, towards us. OK, you change your mind. Well, let, let's see. The current is running in this direction. The magnetic field is downward, so it's towards us. So segment one, let's say F1, is towards us. OK, what's the direction of the force that segment two feels? So this is our system. This is one, this is two. So there, the current, there is a current running in that direction. The mag magnetic field is vertically downward. So the force that segment two feels, hmm? towards the screen, OK, towards the screen, inside the screen. No, I'm, I'm looking at it like this. The current is running like this. The magnetic field is downward. left, right, inside the screen, out of the screen, towards us, away from us. So let's see. If you look at it like this, the, magnet the current is running upward like this. So this is I. B is downward, so our palm should be pointing towards the B and the thumb. So it is towards the left. This is the direction of F2. What about uh, the force acting on 3? Three? 3 is up inside the screen. Inside the screen. Up, left, right, inside the screen. Hmm. Well, let's see. Fingers in the direction of the current. What is the direction of the current? Fingers are like this. Magnetic field is downward. So it should be pointing towards the magnetic field inside the screen. What can you say about the magnitudes of F1 and F3? And our shape is rectangle. If I, you, you see, the force depends on three things. It depends on the current. It depends on the magneti magnitude of the magnetic field. It depends on the length of the wire, the total force acting on a wire. And also, it depends on the angle between the current and the uh, magnetic field. Let's say F1 and F3, they are subject to the same magnetic field, the segment 1 and segment 3, the same magnetic field. Their lengths are identical. It's, they are the opposite size of a rectangle. They carry the same current. And 
the angle they make with the magnetic field is 90 degrees, it's the same. So their magnet, the magnitude of these two forces is exactly equal. And they're in opposite direction. So it already tells me that F1 plus F3, yeah, or F3 is equal to minus F1. So the sum of these two forces is zero. F1 and F, F3, their sum is zero. Now, F2 is towards the right. Let's look at F4, the force acting on segment four. Again, this is our loop, the circumference is our loop. Segment four is over here. It is carrying a current in this direction. What will be the direction of the force? It will be towards the right. You see, this is I, B is downward, so this is the direction of the force. What can you say about the magnitudes of F4 and F2? The magnitudes are identical. Again, they have the same length of wire. They are subject to the same magnetic field. They carry the same current. And the angle they make with the magnetic field is the same. Minus F2. So what can you say about the total force acting on my loop? It is zero. F4, this is equal to zero. Now, let's say, as your friend said, again, this is my loop. So the, the F1, there is a force in this direction over here. Th this is not, F1 is the bottom side. So there is a force in that direction on the first segment. There is a force in the opposite direction in the upper segment, well, that will create a torque. If you look at the side two, there is a force in this direction, and there is a force in the opposite direction. Well, that doesn't create a, if, if, if you consider a torque around this line, around this line, this F2 and F4, they will not create any torque. But F1 and F4, if F1 and F3, it will create a torque. Now, the Sure, sure. I mean, if you would just make such an angle, it will there would have been a torque. But for this configuration, the only torque is due to the forces acting on segment one and segment four. Because if you look at this this figure over here, what is the force acting on this segment over here? Okay, this I is out of the screen. I is like that, B is downward, so this will be the direction of the force. Okay, this is the force. And for the other part, for this part, the direction of the force will be just this one. Minus F. One is F, the other one is minus F. Now, let's just assume that we have our rectangle. These sides are have length. Well, let me just copy it. These sides have length A. This side has length B. So this side has length A. Now, what is the torque created by these forces? And we also know the magnitude. The magnitude of the force is I B times small b. What is the torque relative to this point? Center.
Let's choose some axes to start with. X, Y, and Z. X, ha X hat is pointing out of the screen. Now, what is the torque create? What's the direction of the torque created by this force over here? Out of the screen, inside the screen. Let's remember what torque was. This is the definition of the torque. If you have more than one force acting on your system, R is the point at which the force is acting. This is the position vector of that point. Fi is the force acting at that point. This is how we define the torque. So if you look at this force, the position vector of that force is like that. It's in that direction. The force is pointing like this. So the direction of the torque is out of the screen. That is due to the top part. What about the magnitude of the torque? It's in the exact direction, that's for sure. A over 2 is the length of this vector times the magnitude of the force, which we know that it is this one. And well, how we define the theta, let's check it. it is, OK, that's over here also. Is it sine theta, sine pi over 2 minus theta, pi minus theta? It is this angle over here. So you see, this is our, this is our ri vector. So we should write the ang sine of the angle between these two vectors. And the, the angle is pi over 2 minus theta. OK, so this is the torque created by this force. Now, what about the other force? So here we have to sum all the torques created by the forces. So there is a torque due to this force. What is its direction? Well, again, the position vector of that force is in that direction. This is the position vector. P my palm is in the side where there is the force. So this is the direction of the torque vector. So it's, again, out of the screen. plus x hat, what's its magnitude? Well, a over 2 is the distance from the center. i b times b is the magnitude of the force. Sine of the angle between the two. Again, now this time we should take this angle over here, which is pi over 2 minus theta. So basically, both forces create the same torque. So the torque is I times AB times the magnetic field times cosine of theta in the exact direction. Well, I have A over 2. They both contribute the same. So I just multiply the first one by 2. So this is my loop. This was the magnetic field. This is the direction of P. Now, it would be nice to write this as a vectorial quantity, not just, OK, products of certain quantities in the exact direction, because the, here we are talking about the components. Well, talking in terms of the components, I mean, we don't re really like it because components changes if you change your coordinate axis. We, would, we wouldn't like to do that. We would rather write in terms of quantity, in terms of everything in terms of vectors, so that they, have, they will have the same form in every, in every coordinate axis you choose. 
Okay, on one side, this is nice. We have the B. Uh, remember that we have this quantity called the cross product, which gives us a vector. Yes. Well, because I have two terms. Yes, that's the total. So this is B. And I is going in over here, I is coming out from here. So my current is kind of running like, like this. And this is what we call the theta. Cosine, let, us, let me write over here some angle phi. Well, phi is nothing but pi over 2 minus theta. So this torque is nothing but I A B times B times sine of phi in the exact direction. Now, why I, did why I define this phi, if you look at this expression, it's magnitude. Well, this is the magnitude of a vector that we already know. We defined it as the magnetic field. Then we have the sine of an angle. It just looks like the cross product. The only thing we have to define to identify this exactly with the cross product is to define the vector. Let's call it mu in this direction. And I will define mu. Rem also remember, this is the direction of x hat. This is i, a, b in the x hat direction. Now, if I make this definition, then the torque is nothing but mu cross b. Now, why did I define this mu? Now, it's just like the electric dipole moment. This is what we call the magnetic dipole moment. Now, if you compare with it with the expression for the electric dipole moment, this is the magnetic, this is the electric. Okay, this we this is our mu, this is our let's say P. Now P was the magnitude was Q times D. We had these charges separated by a distance D. Now in the magnetic moment case, the magnitude is I times A B. But AB is nothing but the area. So we have this current running around an area. So that's how we define the magnitudes. Now, if you look at, if you remember the definition of the torque, how much torque acts on an electric dipole in an electric field, it was nothing but P cross E. Now, here the torque is nothing but mu cross P. We, we could store energy, the potential energy of the dipole was nothing but minus P dot E. And the potential energy stored in the magnetic dipole is nothing but mu dot B. So once you calculate this one, you can immediately say that what's the minimum value of this potential? I mean, how, how should the magnetic field and the B should be oriented to have a minimum value over here. It should, be, it should be in the same direction. Scalar product has its maximum value when the two vectors are in the same direction. So for u to be minimum, mu dot b should be a maximum. Mu dot b is a maximum when magnetic dipole moment is in the same direction as the magnetic field. So this basically tells us that, I mean, we, can, we could have also seen it from here. There was a force acting in this direction over here, another force acting in the opposite direction on the top. So the forces were such that they are trying to align mu and b. Now in this case, well, it's obvious from apparent from here, mu and the torque will be such that it will try to ali align the magnetic dipole moment with the magnetic field itself. 
Now, why is this relevant? For example, in, when, in, when we were discussing the dipoles, when you look at the molecules, the mole most of the molecules are nothing but small dipoles. They, have, they are neutral. Nevertheless, they will feel some electric force, some electric, they will have, in, they will be influenced by the electric field because positive and negative charges, they will not be on the average at the same point. They will be displaced slightly. So that will create an electric dipole moment. Again, if you look at the atom, we can model to an extent an atom as just electrons orbiting around the nucleus, but electron is nothing but charge moving so that we can model it as a current. A current is running around an area, so it has a magnetic dipole moment. And the pro how a, a material behaves under an applied magnetic field will depend whether it has some magnetic dipole, a net magnetic dipole moment or not. So we already have seen over here that at least if some material has a magnetic dipole moment, it will feel a torque. And if you put it in a non-uniform magnetic field, it might even feel a force. So when you bring a magnet, what you are actually doing is you are bringing a non-uniform magnetic field. In a non-uniform magnetic field, if you bring a magnetic dipole, it will feel a net force because the you see the force, if you remember how we relate the force to the potential energy, the force is nothing but the derivatives of the potential energy. If B is non-uniform, there will be a force due to this magnetic dipole moment. So if you have a material made up of atoms which have a definite magnetic dipole moment, they will feel a force if you bring a magnet nearby. If they don't have a magnetic dipole moment, when you bring a magnet, they will not feel a force. So they will not be influenced by the magnet. Iron, for example, has a magnetic moment. So that's why an iron is attracted to a magnet. True. Well, you see, the atom, electron is orbiting around it. It has a magnetic dipole moment. Well, of course, atoms do not have one electron. They have many electrons. And in most atoms, the electrons are moving in such a way that the net magnetic moment is zero. They just, they just cancel. Now, this is the external magnetic field. This is the magnetic moment that the material has. So you have the, your material with a magnetic moment. You bring a magnet. It will feel a force. If it's uniform, it will only feel a torque. If it is non-uniform, it will feel a net force. Which doesn't have a dipole moment, you mean? You see, the electric field will be influenced by the... Sure, but it's a magnetic dipole. An electric dipole and the magnetic dipole are completely different things. Not yet, we will. We will discuss it, don't worry. I mean, we didn't yet discuss what creates the magnetic field. I mean, we will be discussing what creates the magnetic field next week. But this week, we are just studying how different materials behave under a magnet magnetic field. Yes, because of the magnetic dipole they have or they don't have. Well, it's good to have questions. Well, the book just follows the kind of the historical, the, uh, not, uh, the book, your book doesn't always follow the historical development, but at least in this case, 
it follows, it does follow it. We first observed the effects of the magnetic field. Then we discovered how that magnetic field is, why, what creates that magnetic field. Let's discuss that in more detail. And we didn't yet discuss how we create the current through a magnetic field. But let's just give a brief introduction. Now, by the way, this is how an electric motor would work. So you have your <coughs> loop. You set a current running around it, which creates a magnetic moment. You put it in a magnetic field. Let's say you start like this, you create a downward magnetic field, you create a, a magnetic dipole moment in this direction. So when you set the current, it will try to align like this. At this moment, you, you need to change the direction of your current. Now your magnetic field is in this direction, the magnetic dipole moment is in this direction. If you change the direction of the current, the direction of the magnetic dipole moment is flipped. Magnetic field is pointing downward, your magnetic dipole moment is pointing upward, so it will try to align, it will keep rotating. Now your magnetic field is, magnetic dipole moment is downward. Now you have to flip the direction of your magnetic field of your current again, so it goes up. Well, if you have an alternating current and you somehow syn synchronize this rotation velocity and with the oscillation frequency of your current, then you don't have to do anything. You just set it in motion and it will keep rotating because the, direct the current will keep changing its direction so it will just be enough. Well, in this uh, battery-powered motors, what you have to do is you have to make sure that when this rotates like this, when the what is inside the motor, the coil, when it rotates by, let's say, 180 degrees, the polarity should flip. You have to make sure that it happens. So well, this, this is how the basically the motors work, how you can build one. The only tricky part is how to flip this, the direction of your current. Well, you have to do it fast if you want your motor to run fast. And one more thing, I mean, the direction of this magnetic dipole moment is also determined by the direction of your current, by the right hand rule. Just curl your fingers in the direction of the current. And the magnetic dipole is in the direction of your thumb. Or you can also write it like this. It is I, the current, times the area vector. Remember, we had discussed the area vector when we were discussing the flux. So it's the same area vector over here. This is the magnetic dipole moment of our system. The direction of this area vector is determined by the direction of the current by the right hand rule. Well, you see, in this one, the loop is running like this. This is the direction of the current, let's say. Take your fingers in the direction of the current. Your thumb is your magnetic dipole moment, your thumb. No, you see, this is the direction. At the top, the current is going in. At the bottom, the current is coming out. So this is the direction. I mean, here, this is how it rotates. So this is the, our loop. So this is the direction of the current. This is the figure on the, on the screen. Just no. I mean, of course, the mass of the loop, the moment of inertia of the loop will determine how fast it how much an angular acceleration it will have, but the magnitude of the torque is independent of the mass. Just like most of the time, the force is independent of the mass, except in gravitational force. The mass only determines the acceleration. Now, 
nice question. We don't know. Why is there a magnetic force in nature? Why is there an electromagnetic force in nature? Let's just generalize it a bit more. We have no answer for that. We only know that there is an electromagnetic force in nature. In fact, until the towards the end of the 1800s and 1900s, we thought that there were two different forces, two completely separate forces, the electric force and the magnetic force. Now at least we know that they are basically the same thing. There is this electromagnetic force acting on charged objects, and one part of this force is independent of the velocity. That part is what we call the electric force. And there is another part which depends on the velocity of the object, and that part is what we call the magnetic force. But why does it exist to start with? We don't know. We don't have an answer yet. For the motor to keep rotating, Uh, usually what is done is this one. So these are your magnets. So these are your magnets. Okay. And inside you have your loops. So here are your loops. Well, how to plot it? Let me just ignore the magnets. You have some magnets which create a magnetic field. This is your loop. Okay, so let's say this is your magnetic field direction you create by some magnets. Now, you, you, don't, you don't just connect it to a battery like this. If you connect it to a battery like this, of course, it will not change. You cannot change the direction of the uh, current. So what you do is, let's just erase these. Here, you attach these points to two circles. And here, not that big, but small. These are your terminals. They're in contact with these, these parts. So as your motor is rotating, at one point, this part will be in touch. Let me draw with them also here. These, these are your segments. As these semicircles is rotating, at one point, this semicircle is in touch with the negative terminal. This semicircle is touch in touch with the positive terminal. At the next instant, if it rotates by, let's say in this case, 90 degrees, they will just change their polarity. So this semicircle will be in touch with the negative terminal and this one will be in touch with the positive terminal. So you automatically flip the direction of the current. If you increase the number of loops, you see this exp Okay, there, there is one thing that I had to mention, this magnetic dipole moment. This is valid for one loop. If you have n loops, each loop will have this magnetic field, magnetic dipole moment. So the combined system will be this magnetic dipole moment multiplied by the number of loops. So if you have many loops, your magnetic dipole moment is proportional to the number of loops. And hence, your torque is proportional to the number of loops. So if you want to build a strong magnet, strong motor, which can lift, let's say, very heavy weights, there are a few things you have to do. You have to you, you have to take a, as large a magnetic. You have to create a large magnetic field as large as you can, and you have to create as much loops as you can, so that this mu will be will increase. 
So it's in such a way that you can create a huge torque which you can use to lift up heavy objects. Like for example the one in the elevator. Well, I mean once you build the motor, it's up to you what you would like to use the motor for. Well, that will be the answer to my previous question. What happens in a, in a different reference frame? But we will discuss it though. Not now. Okay, let's give a 10-minute break, and after that we will continue.